Hi, so today I'm going to cover some of the basics um, that you kind of need to know before you get into Resolve, um, or rather that will at least be very helpful, not just for Resolve, but for really understanding um, color and understanding working with video in general. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the primary colors of light, um, and along those lines, I'm going to talk about the interpretations of color and the different systems uh, we have for doing so. Um, I'm going to talk about bit depth, and I'm going to talk about um, codecs and containers. So first, I'm going to go over the primary colors of light um, and the different means of which we have to interpret color. Um, so color is made up of three primary colors, which is red, green, and blue. Um, and when combined, when combining red, green, and blue, um, evenly, we get white light um, because we're combining the full visible spectrum, um, which appears t as white to us. Um, now, that doesn't actually have to be the only way that we interpret color. White light um, and color in general can be broken up into other colors as well. Um, and there's other systems for dealing with color, um, some of which aren't specific to light, um, some of which are generally seen more with pigments um, or printing. Um, so another interpretation of color breaks it down into CMYK, um, and that's very commonly used for printing. And in the case of CMYK, the C stands for cyan, the M stands for magenta, the Y stands for yellow, and the K stands for key, which means black in this case. Um, there's also another system, um, which was actually the first system that I learned as a very young child, um, which is um, red, blue, and yellow, as opposed to green. And that's sometimes used in the world of art and dealing with pigments. Um, and if you're not familiar with that system, you may ask, well, where do you get green from? Well, green is simply a combination of yellow and blue. And if you combine yellow and blue, you do indeed get green. So you can still make every color from those three colors. Um, so it's another, you know, valid system. Um, it just doesn't really work so well with light. It's more better used for pigments. Um, there's actually other systems. Uh, there's another one called LAB, L-A-B, and that one's a bit more complicated, um, but you can do a lot of very cool things with it, and I will talk more about LAB in its own dedicated video, um, but, uh, but LAB is another cool color space. So now that we, we've understood the primary colors of light, which um, is red, green and blue, and it, it, as long as you understand that even amounts of those colors will form white, um, and of course an absence of all of those colors will be black. Um, now let's hop over into bit depth. So if you're familiar with hexadecimal codes or HTML color codes, um, then you may know that uh, that colors can be broken down for the web into these codes, uh, these hex codes that give different values, uh, that, that can be interpreted as different colors. Now, those colors also have corresponding RGB values, and those RGB values are the different amounts of red, green, and blue that make up those given colors. And you may notice that in this hexadecimal system, all of those numbers cap out at 255. So they go from 0 to 255, which means they have 256 
per value because they can have zero as a value. So that system, this, this hexadecimal system, is an 8-bit system. It's an 8-bit color system. Now what does that mean? Well, what that means is every channel, and a channel meaning one of these colors here, so red is a channel, green is a channel, and blue is a channel, each channel can have 256 values. Um, can range anywhere from zero, and all zeros would be black, of course, up to 255, and all 255s would be white. Um, if you have 255 of one color, but zero of the other two colors, then that's pure the one color that you have 255 of. And so that's how you can break down essentially any color into these values. But why is 256 8 bits? Well, there's higher bit depths, and of course we prefer to work in higher bit depths because the fewer color options you have, the um, fewer steps between colors there are, and that results in what's called banding. So you can get visible banding if you push and pull a clip that has too low bit depth. But the reason that 8 bits is 256 values per channel is because there, there's a simple calculation which is 2 to the x values per channel where x equals bit depth. So in the case of 256, that's 2 to the 8th power is 256. For 10 bits, 2 to the 10th power is 1024, which is the number of values per channel you get with 10-bit color. Now, 12-bit would be even better, and 16-bit, of course, would be better than that. Um, the, the more bit depth you have, the, the more steps you have between colors, and that gives you kind of smoother steps to work with and allows you to push and pull your footage while seeing less degradation. So bit depth is something where we like more of. Um, you know, the more we can get, the better. So now I'm going to talk about codecs and containers. Well, what is a codec and what is a container and how are they different from each other? A codec stands for coder decoder. And so what that means is that defines how data is stored and how it's interpreted. So in the case of, let's say, ProRes, ProRes is what's called an intra-frame codec, which means that every frame gets its own image. Every frame is defined. Um, something like H.264 is what's called an inter-frame codec. And so you'll have what are called iframes, which are keyframes, and those will be essentially images, but you'll also have what are called p-frames and b-frames in these inter-frame codecs. And so what a p-frame is, is p stands for predicted frame, and in a b-frame, it's a bidirectional predicted frame. And so in something like an H.264 file, you'll have these different um, interspersed iframes, and in between those, you'll have P frames, which kind of count backwards to iframes to figure out what change has been made from the iframe and what change, you know, needs to take effect. And then you have B frames, which both look backwards and look forwards to create an image. Now, why would we not want to use something like H.264 to edit with for the most part? Well, H.264 files are pretty lightweight, they're pretty small. However, because of this system, this interframe system, which is also called long GOP, or a long group of pictures, um, that something like this H.264 isn't ideal for editing because it actually requires quite a bit of processing power for counting forwards and backwards from these B frames and counting 
backwards to iframes for these P frames to figure out what a frame should look like. So it constantly, when you're not on an iframe, it constantly has to do some searching backwards or forwards to figure out what your image should look like because it's taking a keyframe and it's calculating all these differences from the last keyframe or even in the case of B frames up to the next iframe up to the next keyframe to figure out what your image should look like and that ends up kind of bogging down your computer while it tries to calculate this for you. Something like an intraframe codec is much better to edit with because it doesn't have to do all these calculations. They're, they're usually larger in file size, however the quality is often better and it will generally play back much smoother because it's much less work on the processor. Now, what is a container and how is it different from a codec? Well, a container, which you can see in this format tab here in Resolve, would be something like QuickTime, which would be an MOV, or something like MXF. And there's actually two main types of MXFs. There, there's these ones that you can see are called OP1A, and those are MXFs stored from a camera. So you can see that these are F65 RAW, and those were shot by a Sony F65, and so those were stored by a camera. There's a different type of MXF, which you can see over here, called OP Atom, and that's the type of MXF used in editorial by systems like Avid. Um, MXF is a very good uh, common container and you can see here that it would be used when making something like a DCP which is the sort of collection of files that we use on cinema projectors. Um, so it's a, it's a common container but it is not the codec. The codec, as you can see with this F65 RAW, is different. Both of these are MXF files, but both of these have different codecs. Both of the codecs are F65 RAW, but the variant differs. And in the case of these QuickTimes, these MOV files both happen to be ProRes 422s, but MOVs can be a number, a huge number of codecs that are not just ProRes. They could be H.264s. You can even store an Avid DNxHD codec inside of an MOV as opposed to an MXF, which would be kind of more common with that codec. So the format or the container is just what holds the information, what holds the codec. It's in the case of an MOV, it's intended generally to play through QuickTime. Um, in the case of an MXF, it can be used with a number of pieces of software. And even a QuickTime file, of course, can be used with a number of pieces of software. But the actual codec, the actual thing that's defining how your information is coded and decoded is independent but tied to the container. So it's independent of the container, but certain containers can and can't accept different codecs. Um, some codecs are only used for shooting. For instance, I can't export a Sony F65 RAW clip from my Deliver tab here in Resolve. I simply can't do it because my computer is not a Sony F65. Um, some codecs are generally used for editing. Um, things like ProRes, though cameras certainly shoot ProRes, but ProRes originally was intended as an editing format for Final Cut Pro. Um, DNX HD and now DNX HR are editing codecs for Avid. Now also some cameras can shoot DNX but those originally were intended as editing codecs. And there's different advantages to certain codecs. So codecs like H.264 and H.265 are good codecs for uploading to the web because they're pretty 
small in file sizes, and some people with limited internet access may prefer those so that they aren't waiting on, say, 100 gig ProRes files to upload, whereas they could perhaps get away with a substantially smaller H.265 file that maybe has a fair amount of the quality that you would get in the ProRes file. So there's different advantages to different codecs, but you need to know the limitations of them. For instance, like the limitations of H.264 and of other interframe codecs and why you may not want to use those for some things like editing, but why you may want to use those for other things such as web uploads. So this is admittedly a rather elementary subject here. I hope you found this informative, but we are going to have to cover some basic steps here to catch people who may not be familiar with some of these concepts up to speed so that going forward, they are on the same page. Uh, if you have any ideas, anything that you want to see, feel free to leave them in the comments. I will try to include as many requested videos as well, but I do need to stick to a set curriculum as there is a set exam that you need to pass in order to get certification. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and thanks for your time.